People's Radio United. And we are live. So this is the 33rd episode of My Non-Objective Opinion, I believe. And we are back with Bushido Squirrel, who's been a guest before, way, way back during Occupy Ice, I believe. How are you, man? Damn. That that was a while ago. I'm doing all right, you know. I'm uh, chilling, hanging in there, enjoying uh, the sudden leap to summer here in Los Angeles. Yeah, it just it was just like one day it was cold and windy and rainy, and the next day it was hot. <laughs> yep. This it's is been uh, that way. this is gonna be, yeah, man. It's gonna be a brutal wildfire season. Like it's gonna be a it's gonna be a long hot summer. So if you thought last summer was uh, filled with tension and bullshit, just wait till this summer. Yeah. So, as always, we're live on um, Spreaker and Twitch. So, welcome to everyone and anyone who's listening on either platform. And we'll be up on YouTube as soon as this show's over. It'll post. So, yeah. um, We're going to be talking about activism and the role the street medic plays in it today. Because you are a street medic. (laughs) Yep. I knew um, that for a while. Yeah, for sure. Um, And then... Maybe you can just tell everybody about a little bit about you, how you got into it, and what you do out there during yeah, protests. Uh, so, yeah, so I go under the moniker Bushido Squirrel. I've been an uh, organizer with Ground Game Los Angeles, which is a uh, – we're technically a C4, so like we're a political nonprofit. But our leanings and our way of internally organizing is very anarchist and very like horizontalist. And so we do everything from like managing actual political campaigns here in Los Angeles to like – you know, setting up Occupy Ice LA, uh, which, you know, I, I got to spend a lot of time with you at that. Um, and so I've been with uh, Ground Game for about four years. I'm actually transitioning out of that because I've got other stuff coming up on my plate that's not going to allow me to uh, do activism stuff as much. But i um, still planning to keep doing the, the street medic stuff. I've been a street medic for a long while, um, you know, starting out back around 2000, like training with some west coast like anarchist collectives to get like the basics in uh first aid and like traumatic injury care uh and then from there like i've kind of kept up training mainly through like red cross and and uh other organizations that offer things like backcountry rescue that offer like higher levels of care not just like first aid and cpr uh and then recently like transitioned into an actual healthcare job and got like a medical license and stuff um and so uh, I've been doing that for a long while and, you know, taking breaks intermittently is like uh, as things cool down. And then last summer, obviously, I had to do a whole lot of it all across the city as protests, you know, pretty much gripped Los Angeles and the nation for several months. Uh, and it's really interesting. It's good work. If anybody's interested in training for that, I can share some documents at the end. You can feel free to pass la- pass around. Um, basic first aid is real easy to learn. Basic CPR is real easy to learn. Um, we're going to need more people like street medics in the future, not just for actions. But if you look around at the unhoused population, that's more of my job as a street medic, yes. treating people who are living on the street than it is like going to actions. You know, um, there's a lot more need out there for people who are just trying to survive in these collapsing cities that we live in. And Los Angeles being the epicenter of the the crisis in housing and the crisis in shelter um, is a very intense place to be kind of like working and volunteering at the moment. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I'd be out there too. Not, I'm not as a street medic, you know. I just yeah try to help people and film and fight when I can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, no, it's it's nuts. It's like everywhere I go, I just see you know. Ground Game obviously has done a lot of work with the unhoused. We were big in organizing the Echo Park Lake community, um, and you know, big in fighting against Mitch O'Farrell's like sweeps there. But you know, if you look at it, if you game this out, looking like six months in the future, you know we're just going to see more sweeps like what we saw in Echo Park Lake. And, like, people are going to keep getting hurt. And, like, the cops don't give a fuck about that. They they broke a journalist's arm at Echo Park Lake for literally no reason. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're terrible. They're, they're, they're horrible monsters, these pigs. But, um, you know, it, people might not understand how important street medics are. They'll be like, well, you have ambulances, you have cops out there, especially during protests. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've been to situations. I don't know if you were there or not. I, I don't remember who the street medics were. There was like four or five of them that day. It was a huge protest. It was probably way back in the anonymous days. And um, some dude, not with the protest, just a houseless dude, I believe, was walking down the street. And I'm not sure if the police pushed him or he tripped. Nobody was really clear on that. 
what had happened. But he, anyway, he ended up on his head and he was bleeding out all over the um, the concrete. Yeah. So the street medics went to try to help him. There was three or four of them. I don't know if you were one of them or not, but um, it's a I long time so. ago. I think I, I, yeah, I think I know the action you're talking about, but I don't think I was there. Yeah, so the police stood around him and wouldn't let anybody help him. And they're like, ambulances yeah. are coming. These people are like, he's bleeding out. He, like, they don't have time for an ambulance. Let us help him. And they're like, well, no, the no, no. The thing that's really fucked up about that is police are supposed to be uh, emergency medical responders. And, and an EMR is like a level below an EMT. So an EMR is supposed to have a little bit more advanced first aid training, some more advanced CPR training, uh, understand how to like work with other emergency services. So like every police officer there was qualified and in fact obligated to offer that man care. But when there's a protest situation, the police do not let ambulances in. Um, for a number of reasons. One, it's a demoralizing thing. You know, if people get hurt and you're not able to get them to help, that affects the crowd. It also makes it less likely that people are going to take chances because they know that help isn't very close. Uh, they also, the excuse that they always use is, well, the scene isn't safe for the EMTs to do their work. But like, I've never been in a situation where people don't get out of the EMTs way, right? Like no protester there are going to like start attacking the EMTs for trying to help somebody. Man, we've uh, let them the through police. before. That's the only yeah. emergency. The fire department and the EMTs always get through. We'll clear the streets. We yeah. just don't let the pigs through. Yep. And that's and it's frustrating because the police will hold back help. And so for like that guy, um, you know, I'm sure an ambulance did respond. He should have gotten help before that. Yeah, it, it was like 30, like 40. Mi- I'm sorry. It was 30 or 40 minutes later. We had to oh, basically fight with these four cops. Threatened to threaten them. They were threatening us to jail time. We pushed them out the way and the medics got to him. But oh, it was, it nice. was, it was, I mean, I think they saved his life because, like I said, the, the, the ambulance didn't show up for like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. He was already yeah. back conscious, sitting up with ice on his head and wrapped up and everything. And that yeah. was the street medics. The cops didn't do anything but stand there in a threatening manner until we pushed him back. Yeah. And that's why street medics are really important in these situations is the police aren't going to help you and they're not going to let the help through. You know, um, there were some really bad injuries last year at the at Fairfax. Um, I'm sure you were out there, but like there was the one woman who was shot directly in the face with a non lethal. Like it shattered her jaw, like just absolutely shattered her face. Um, And we were uh, a street medic that I was working with uh, was treating her. And then another guy who was an off duty nurse or an off duty paramedic. I can't remember which was like, she's too badly hurt. We need to put her in a car and get her to the, the hospital, which. They did, and I believe now she's part of the NLG's class action lawsuit against LAPD um, because they caused some massive injuries. Like those less than lethals that they use, they they aim those right at people's faces. Yeah, they was aiming at me. I got hit like four or five times in the legs and the back running down the street. I got hit with the the, uh, flashbang, hit me in the eye. I was all messed up for like two weeks after that, dude. I mean, not directly, but, you know, the sparks sparks from it or something hit me in my eye. I was burning for – I was pouring water in it. It was miserable, yeah, man. Yeah, that's, that's really messed up because you're not like – that's not what those weapons are supposed to do. Like it's kind of stupid to say like they're using them against regulations as though like using those weapons should ever be within regulation. But even by the loosest standards the cops have, they manage to completely violate those standards. Like it's one of the reasons why I don't think – you know, I, I'm an abolitionist. I'm not a reformist when it comes to police because the, the reforms that we put Thank in you. that should be easy for cops to follow – they don't fucking follow those. They don't care. Like, this isn't an institution that's designed to give a fuck about that stuff. No, it isn't. It, it's work, like people say, the system's working exactly as it was designed to. Yeah. So, yeah, you have to abolish it. Why not start with the police that's eating up all our budget? Think of the homelessness we could, homelessness issues we could solve if we took half the police budget or more, or all the police yeah. budget. But anyway, let me let me ask you this. For for people, because, you know, we have people that are been protesting for years and years like you and me. And we have people that are just maybe thinking of going out there or just started. What would you recommend everyone bring as a kit when they go out, like everybody, even if they don't have training or whatever? Is there anything, you, I mean, you know, things people should have? I know I have an answer, yeah. that I think, but I want to hear from you. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty simple stuff. So like the stuff you want to you want to have on you in case of an emergency is stuff that's going to get you some distance from the the danger, stuff that's going to be able to stop anything from leaking out of you should you get hurt, and stuff that's going to identify you should you really get hurt and have to get sent to the hospital. So, 
you know, the, the basic stuff is how you dress. Um, you don't want to be wearing like shorts and flip flops. You want nice, comfortable shoes that you can run in like those steel toed boots. I'm sure they're really hardy, but can you actually run for, you know, four blocks in those at like a good pace? And if the answer is no, don't wear those, uh, wear some like nice, thick denim jeans, wear something that protects your skin a little bit, wear, you know, a shirt that's got some thickness to it and like a, an outer layer, like a windbreaker of some sort that you don't mind losing. Um, bring a hat, wear your sunscreen, bring some snacks and some water. Cause that's, you know, more than anything, when I'm treating people out at outdoor events, it's, they don't eat enough and they don't drink enough water and they dehydrate and they exhaust themselves. And that's when they get into trouble. So if you're going to be out in the sun, remember the cops get to switch off shifts. We don't get to switch off shifts. So you have to make sure that you're prepared to stand in the sun and not get heat exhaustion, not get a really bad sunburn, knowing that the people you're facing off against, they get to go into the shade and drink water and stuff. So bring water, bring snacks. And then lastly is like a little personal first aid kit that fits in your pocket is probably going to be good enough. You know, it's got stuff to control bleeding. It's probably got some Tylenol in it if you get like a headache or you get a bruise or something. If it's going to be something more like you have a fracture or you have a lot of bleeding or you get injured in a very serious way there's going to be street medics around it's good to know where they're at and it's good to kind of think about that and have a plan with your friends like the best idea is to prepare so have a protest buddy and this is part of your kid is you and your protest buddy you don't leave each other's side you stick with each other from when you get there to when you leave and that not only makes it more likely that you're going to be safe but if something happens to the either to the other one of you you can report back to the rest of your comrades you can know what happened did that person get arrested did that person go to jail? Did that person get hurt? It's it's um, it just makes it safer overall. So planning and preparation is the best thing. If you want to bring more like stuff to a protest, if you feel like it's going to be really escalated and you need a really good um, like have everything I need to save my own life on me sort of thing, then I suggest an IFAK, which you spell I-F-A-K, and that's an individual first aid kit. And those contain everything you need to treat very traumatic injuries. So it comes with a tourniquet. It comes with compression bandages. It comes with um, occlusive dressing so you can treat things like gunshot wounds to the torso. This is really save your life stuff. And it all comes in a nice little package. You can keep it on you. And should you get seriously hurt, somebody else doesn't have to break in their, their own kit to treat you. You've got everything right there to be treated and stabilized and move to a higher level of care. So depending on where you want to go, you can either And they can get those. They, where yeah. can they get those? Uh, so I send people, uh, I suggest a company called North American rescue, which like, I'm really sorry, but they're like one of those, they really like blue lives matter type companies. They're very like pro the troops and stuff like that. They make the best equipment out there. When you're looking at tourniquets, the North American rescue tourniquet is the standard. It's what's carried in ambulances. It's what's carried in, uh, military kits. It's what hospitals use. Uh, they're really good. They work well. The windlass doesn't break. It's something that you can trust to save a life. Like you can go out there and you can buy knockoffs on, on like Amazon or eBay or stuff. And if you're buying like a $15 tourniquet, you better hope that windlass doesn't break because if it does, that could be your life. So for me, I say go for the like the really high grade shit. And uh, North American Rescue is the place I would suggest. And you're spending anywhere from like $50 to like $200. I would say the $75 to $90 range is about where you want to go for a quality IFAC. Yeah, not everybody can afford that, and they should just do what they can. But, yeah. you know, the more people that might have those out there, even if they don't know what to do with it, I'm sure there's a medic or someone that might need it at one point. It's better to have it not need it yeah. than to need it not have it. Yeah. And the and those, water, those man. Are again, yeah, the those water. Are for, uh, I was, was going to say. Just for the IFAX, like, those, yeah. are, those are just, those are super advanced stuff, and it's its job is to keep you alive specifically. So you're carrying the stuff on you that somebody else will use. So even if you don't know how to use an IFAC, one's still a good idea if you can afford it or put it together yourself. Um, on the other hand, getting that training to learn to use a tourniquet, to learn how to stop direct or to learn how to stop major bleeding isn't really, really hard. Um, so I'd suggest, you know, getting some of that training is helpful too, but yeah, um, the water's a really big one. Sorry to cut you off there. Yeah, no, no, no. I was just, I was going backwards. I was just going to say like, people don't think about that, but like, especially here, here in LA. Yeah. But down South where it gets so hot and humid, I've been to protests where people are just passing out all over and they need water, heat exhaustion. Um, you know, especially older women and stuff yeah. like that. Like older ladies were just like passing out at bus stops and stuff. Yeah, it was it was really bad. We had to get try to get water. We ended up having to like break into stores and get water for people because 
it was this little racist town and they had closed everything off and wouldn't serve black people. But um, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but There's yeah. also, it, the, the water's good because if like, if you get hit with pepper spray or like the cops release tear gas, if some sort of chemical weapon gets released onto your face by like a proud boy or whatever, the water is what we'll use to wash it. So having yeah. water there and having everybody have water can also be a group safety thing, not just keeping you hydrated, but helping us like clean people's faces off because it's it, water is yeah. heavy to carry around. You know, I keep seven gallons in my car, but I'm not lugging seven gallons worth of water around with me at a protest. That's insane. Yeah, I usually bring a few bottles planning, you know, I'll freeze them sometimes before I go. So yeah. I can like, you know, if it's going to be hot and I could hand them a couple to people and I'll keep one or two for myself. That's generally, yeah. when, I mean, when I'm out at a protest, that the camp and stuff, I was trying to bring as much as I could for everybody else. But we weren't yeah. really marching there, you know. So, yeah, um, that that's awesome. So what, um, let's say somebody is thinking, like, you know, I'm out here at protest, I could do more. How would they go about getting the training needed to become a street medic, to do it right? I mean, anyone I know can be a street medic. As far as just quote unquote, I'm a street medic. I have band aids or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, you know, to really get the training to do it right, where you something happens, you're going to be the one to save somebody's life. Maybe. I would say my my suggestion would be uh, to take some classes uh, just to get a firm grounding in this stuff with like the Red Cross. The the two that I suggest are CPR, AED, and first aid, which is like the basic class. And a lot of people, if you're in the service industry you may have had to take this class to work at a restaurant or, or work at a coffee shop. Um, and then the next one would be wildland rescue. And also you can also get that through like national outdoor leadership school. So there's a couple of places you can go. Um, but these are classes where you'll get like a firm understanding of why you're doing what you're doing, how to figure out what type of trouble somebody's in, right? Not just to look at somebody and be like, wow, that person's sick or that person's not yeah. doing well. But to know, like, oh, th this person has heat exhaustion. Oh, crap, this person has heat stroke. Oh, shoot, this seems like a really bad sprain versus this seems like a really bad break. Um, and that it's all pretty useful stuff to have. It's not super expensive. It's a couple weekends of your time at most invested in, like, going to class and then doing the hands-on skills. If you want to get even more advanced than that, like, there are EMT schools you can go to uh, in all 50 states. But especially here in Southern California, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and it'll cost you anywhere from like 800 to maybe $2,000, depending on the school and the program you're going to, to get an EMT license or get the training for an EMT. If you then want to like go get the, the license and take the NREMT and become like a fully licensed EMT, it's a, another couple hundred bucks for the tests and stuff. But it's about um, 12 to 24-ish weeks worth of training to go through that those sorts of programs. So it's not a huge time investment. It can be costly. Uh, but I think first aid kits are pretty much all you need. And then from there, like, or first aid training is all you really need. But from there, get comrades together and practice this stuff. You know, I'll share this document with you, Tim, uh, that you can pass around that's from Black Cross, which is a defunct anarchist collective. But they have a series of trainings for street medics and people who even have not any experience in doing this stuff but hands-on scenarios that you all can run together. So like you go on a hike and you just sort of like plan and practice scenarios as you go on a hike. And these trainings, you can do anywhere from like four hours to up to 16 hours worth of training and just kind of hands-on stuff. And you want it to be hands-on because this is muscle memory. You know, there's yeah. a lot like that's why we train CPR the way we do, where if you've ever gotten a CPR card, you're just pumping that chest for most of that class. And why? Because we want your muscles to train and this is what this feels like. This is how hard I have to go. This is how hard I have to press. Because A, you're probably not ever going to use it and B, your brain is going to evacuate your body when shit really goes wrong. Like, you remember that movie The Last Samurai where Tom Cruise is like getting his ass kicked in the village like trying to fight all of the, the other warriors and one of them just tells him, too much mind? And that's the way things go when you're in a really traumatic scenario. You want to be trained to the point where you're not thinking about what to do you're just doing it. You're just sort of turning off that ego, doing what needs to be done in the moment, and then processing it all later. So you can just focus on taking care of the person in front of you. Yeah. So let's go back a step real quick. I had a question. Um, so sure. you said the, the, the basic, you know, just to get the basics would be the first aid and the CPR class. Do they have places? I mean, we're, we're talking to people all over you know, the world or but in the U.S., yeah. do they got places where that's free or really dirt cheap where anyone could pretty much get it, get the training or? 
so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of places that will offer training for free. I know there's a few anarchist collectives, like even out here in LA, um, that, that offer, you know, um, sessions in basic first aid and basic street medicine. And that's a good like way to practice and kind of see what's going on. Um, there are some red, like the Red Cross itself is kind of, they're, they're a business, they're a nonprofit, but they're, they're a business when it comes down to it. So the minimum they'll charge you to have that CPR card is about 25 bucks. Like that's just what they charge to give you the certificate. So, uh, here through like ground game LA, uh, like I'm a Red Cross trainer. I will be offering Red Cross training soon. I'm just waiting for the Red Cross to actually send me my fucking like mannequins and training supplies. So I'm on hold until then. But that is something where we're trying to make it as, as low or no cost as we can for certain community groups. So it's more a need based sort of thing. Um, but we're also, you know, looking to expand that because this training isn't that hard to get once you have it. It's not that hard to learn this stuff. If you want that piece of paper that says I'm trained in CPR, which can be useful for getting a job. It also counts as a form of medical license. Like having that card makes you, slightly more qualified than your average layperson just walking would, around there on the street. Would having that card back the cops the hell up if someone was injured or would they still be no, dicks about because it? The, oh, they'd still be dicks about it because the cops are trained to a higher standard. I, 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 I didn't mean dicks. Yeah. But I mean, would they still refuse? Cause they're always going to be dicks. I'm oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, they're totally going to do that. You can see that. Um, remember when that guy got shot up in Portland, um, by Reinhold or whatever his name was. Um, yeah. Street medic started treating that person and the street medic who started treating the person who was shot um, began it was like a trained I believe they were a paramedic or a nurse and the police came and shoved them off of the the person even though wow. the medic identified themselves because the cops in that situation they don't care they're really like they don't give a flying fuck um, and so it may have cost that dude his life because the cops waited to get medical help in there instead of accepting the help of a, a street medic who was perfectly qualified for it so and the cops are pretty wow. bad at providing care. They're just like, you know, there's so many stories we have here in L.A. of them shooting someone and then just leaving that person in the street for hours and hours and hours. They just stand like around. They don't, yeah, they don't approach that person and check on them. They don't order medical aid. Like, oh, they, they, no approach him, they approach they him and cuff him. Kill. They approach yeah. him and cuff him and search him and then leave him and just walk around. Yeah. They're disgusting, no, it's, man. It's, it's pointless. Yeah. So the cops really, in that case, like the cops are not going to um care whatever your medical license is you know they're they're not going to give a flying fuck about that um their their job is to control the situation and that includes keeping you or stopping you from helping so basically just for a street medic if you're not worried about it for a job or anything you don't need that piece of paper correct exactly you you don't okay. it's it's good to have you know just because it gives you a grounding and stuff but like there are other ways for you to get that training that don't involve having to sit through that class or pay the Red Cross any money. Yeah, definitely let, hit me up when you when you get set up for that, you know, in the area here, because I got some people oh, yeah. and, you know, I'm sure some of them have money for sure to pay. Um, and other ones, maybe we can work something out and pay for them or something just to get yeah. people on there. You know, my, my take on this stuff is that it's, I want it to be as free and as low cost as possible because this is life-saving stuff. You know, like I've used the Heimlich on people twice and that saves somebody's life, even though it's a very simple thing to know and a simple thing to learn. And these skills will also kind of like help you understand how these systems work a little bit, like how body systems work and how to think about it, because I just find it really cool stuff. You know, the way that our body fits together and works is just fascinating to me. So learning first aid and stuff is also a good way to get some insight into into that like aspect of yourself. Yeah, definitely. It's like you, it's like a car. If you know how it works, you can fix it easier. I, I yeah, don't know how a, a car works. <laughs> it's a you know a, a car built over like three billion years of evolution, and it's just it's just fucking nifty. I'm sorry. I was reading what you just sent me to Black Cross Medical First Aid. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah I'm gonna definitely. Know, I can. You, I can you just can share find that. that online, but. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the the Black Cross website still around. The the collective itself is shut down and has been for a while, but all their stuff's online and free, and it's pretty good. Like, and it's decent to just kind of read through it and get a sense there um, of what's going on. You know, um, it, like what kind of training you want to think about. Um, but one thing I also do, do on the ground is, you know, especially being like a street medic, um, you know, 
we get we got a lot of um like press over the summer because of the big protests. But like I was saying, so much of this work is more community based. It's like showing up when somebody doesn't want to go to a hospital and like figuring out what's going on, helping them out, taking care of like acute stuff at encampments. Like those are the people that really need help is the people in your community, like learning this stuff as cool as it sounds to be like, I'm going to be at a protest. I'm going to save a life. It's like, you're more likely going to like notice that your elderly neighbor is kind of sick and like ask them how they're doing and maybe be able to give them a rudimentary checkout and then make sure that they get in contact with their doctor and you make sure they're taking their pills. Like if you have an elderly neighbor that you want to do a favor for, ask them if you can organize their pills for them because that is such a huge help. And that's the kind of stuff like those are the people being let down most acutely by this system. Yeah. I was going to get into the um, encampments next, but you just brought something up. I wasn't even thinking about like just community in general, not just your houseless neighbors, but all your neighbors like, like, having this basic information yeah it's just good all around i mean we all should think about trying to get access to that information um yeah no matter who you are i didn't even think about it like that before i mean i obviously seen street medics dealing with with um people in encampments because i'm there all the time but then yeah protest i i've seen that too but yeah if you have that you could help everybody i mean I've seen situations where so many times where somebody's doing bad and we have to call an ambulance or a paramedic and try to give them water or something and try to help them out. But if you don't have the knowledge, the basic, yeah. the basic knowledge, you're just kind of just, I guess, grasping around in the dark for straws or whatever, however they say that. Yeah. Well, and a lot of it's also just preventative. Like that's one of the things that frustrates me a lot when I'm working out at encampments uh, around L.A. is – how much of the sickness I see is just preventable and like how much it it would be very easy to just like take care of people. And it is frustrating that we have to bridge that gap ourselves, but like that's where we're left, you know, with LAFD, um, they, they don't like doing the medical calls. They don't like showing up to an old person who's just not feeling a little ill. They want to do the like fires and the car accidents and the really cool, like glamorous stuff. But because our system's so broken, if you have like your neighbor who's having a hard time breathing and she's an elderly woman who can't get herself to the hospital, the only option is to call 911. And then you have like a half dozen firefighters show up which for a call that doesn't need that at all. And then LAFD gets like really sassy about that shit because they don't want to be doing that work and they act like assholes, you know, getting them yeah. to respond to an encampment is nearly impossible. Like unless somebody is about to die they're not showing up if you're like i got this guy that's really sick they're like yeah wow that's wow that sucks good luck with that and, and a, a lot of times an ambulance or ride to the hospital a lot of times in the academies they come with police who have their guns and attitudes and everything yeah i mean that's the other problem with the ems system is our hospitals our ems like emergency medical services they're cops in a sense like hospitals collect a shit ton of data they work with the cops they like will let the police come and interview people when they're in the hospital healing um our ems services are really close with the cops they they have to work together um you know training for emts involves a lot of places where the training is literally you know if such a thing happens call the police like if you walk into a house and you see a gun on a table leave that house and call the police to come like take care to control that gun you're in the united states most houses have a gun somewhere yeah exactly Exactly. And it's it's one where over and over and over again, you're just kind of finding the system that doesn't want to treat people like it only wants to treat the people that are um, already able to take care of themselves. You know, rich white people in Brentwood who have health insurance, they get taken care of people who live in South L.A. that, you know, are working as gig economy drivers that don't get any insurance or enough to pay for their own health insurance like those people get get absolutely fucked. Yeah, yeah. That's because um, you don't really want to help anybody unless you can get paid for it, right? That's the American way. <laughs> yeah, no, it's. Uh, I saw this guy on Twitter yelling at EMTs because ambulance rides are so expensive, and it's like, motherfucker, EMTs get paid minimum wage and don't set the the price for your ambulance. Like the yeah. the twenty five hundred dollar bill for that ambulance is not going to the EMT's pocket. No, they need to take it up with the people that keep voting for politicians that let these people run amok i mean yeah. we pay taxes we should have medical care it's just that simple whatever they want to yeah. call it socialism or whatever it's just it's just get people help 
I mean, nobody's yeah. screaming Canada's socialist or, you know, <laughs> they got medical I care. I mean, they try, other... but it makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, and if it is, it's not, then so what's wrong with it? I know they always go to Venezuela or some place that we've destroyed and made it a hellhole. And then, but, um, yeah, it's just, it's ridiculous. The medical care in this country It's ridiculous. We need street medics. No offense. I'm just saying no, <laughs> we should, no, we should be like, yeah, up. we're going to get, we should have, we should have medical help for free as fast as we have the police coming to gun us down for free. Well, it's, it's weird. Like, cause here in LA, there are, you know, there are a lot of nonprofits that bill themselves as like offering health care to people who are on a house um, or like people who are very low income. And what you find out when you start interacting with them is they don't, you know, like if you have, if you're trying to, if you're dealing with like a substance use disorder, there are a bunch of places here in LA that will send you to rehab until your insurance runs out and then they'll kick you out. There are a bunch of nonprofits who will show up and like get you suboxone, get you methadone, whatever. But if you're like an unhoused person who's suffering from type one diabetes, there's nobody out there who's going to get you your insulin. And it's such an easy, simple fix. Like the way that the system is designed is designed to not help people unless they fall into a couple of very niche categories. And even then it's designed to kick them out. It's like the bullshit with Project Room Key. We're like, yeah, you can get a hotel room, but you have to be back in your room by 7 p.m. And if you don't, if you show up at 7.05, then you have to wait until tomorrow to get into your room. And also we might kick you out for being an adult who missed their curfew. You know, and I'm... People don't talk about this a lot. And you got armed police guarding the the entrance of the place usually. Yeah. Well, that's a fucked up thing. We got those bridge, the bridge home shelters, you know, where you're supposed to stay for 90 days and people end up staying there for like two years. Um, But they spend more on policing those places than they do on the upkeep of those places. So like LAPD has whole specialized patrols that that cost more money than the actual shelter does to run just patrolling the like four blocks around the shelter to uh, harass every other unhoused person who's not in that very tiny shelter. I would be fine with this if they closed the gates to Bel Air at 8 p.m. at night and wouldn't let anyone in or out (laughs) and treat them exactly the same. You know, so if the richest of the rich can get treated like that, then they can treat everyone like that. But until then, nah, that ain't working. I, so, I like this idea of building a, a massive wall around Beverly Hills. I think that would be better for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Beverly Hills sucks. I've actually been kicked out of that city years and years ago, followed by the sheriffs to the edge of the city and told, don't come back <laughs> or you'll be arrested. Stay out of Malibu, Lebowski. And I was trying to get something to eat with somebody pretty famous, but they happen to be black. So, <laughs> oh, Yeah. No, remember a few years ago, like I was working in Beverly Hills and there was a whole flurry of like police bullshit. And it turns out that a bank got robbed. And so a couple of LAPD or not LAPD, a couple of Beverly Hills finest uh, arrested the first black guy they saw and accused him of like robbing the bank. And it turns out he's this like world famous producer. Um, and it was just, you know, it, fucking Beverly Hills in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't like that. I'd be nervous as soon as I get in that stupid city. But um, well, they just lost that case against the uh, the Black Future Project, um, which is pretty good. Like they arrested a whole bunch of people for their bullshit, unconstitutional like noise um, law that was uh, put in place yeah. to like stop BLM protests from happening there. Unfortunately, yeah. like the courts threw that threw all the all the um, charges out because they're like, yeah, this law is wildly unconstitutional and stupid. And Beverly Hills was in such hot water over this that no, like Beverly Hills doesn't have their own district attorney or anything. They rely on LA County to provide them prosecutors or other cities to like provide them prosecutors to try cases. And nobody wanted to try this case. Wait, so they had wait, to like, why? They're rich. Entire... Well, because nobody wanted to touch it. Like every lawyer in LA County and every other. No, but I'm saying why like, doesn't Beverly Hills have their own? Why are they using LA? They got their own PD. Because they never, they, they never use them like the the prosecutors oh. they wouldn't use enough most of the th- most of the the criminal activity or whatever in beverly hills is like you know running stop signs or speeding or like being a poor person in a minivan uh on wilshire boulevard like most of it's not criminal stuff they don't need that so um for this one they had to go hire like a private attorney firm to like prosecute their cases like everyone thought this was such bullshit that they had to literally pay to have somebody do that for them Everyone was right. <laughs> yeah. Surprisingly. 
Yeah, I I, I wanted to go back to another thing about the um, the encampment thing because I noticed something a yeah. lot, and this I mean the. the the way to prevent this is to buy people socks and shoes when possible. But so many people, because they wear the same shoes and socks so long, their feet are tore up. Some people don't even have shoes. And, no, and it's get, uh, extremely really painful. Yeah, they get really bad trench foot. They get really bad fungus growing there. Uh, I see a lot of skin infections, um, a lot of what's called dermatitis, which is um, an inflammation of an area of the skin. Um, I see a lot of people that like, might be carrying some MRSA around. Um, there's a lot of really gnarly stuff out there that could easily be prevented by just having access to a fucking shower. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> so many s- simpler solutions. Uh, I had well, seen that's these. The thing about EPL that pissed me off is like the community there built their own fucking showers, and Mitch and the LAPD came and tore them down. And it's like, you know, fuck you guys. Yeah. I... <sighs> I mean, I've seen during the virus, I've seen things where they'll bring showers some places every day, some places a couple of times a week, like mobile showers. There's been yeah. more there's been more um, portable restrooms as well as sinks and stuff out there lately. But now they've been doing a lot of sweeps. So everything's just wiped out in a lot of places and they're doing them quietly, yeah. too. Quietly late at night, like I said on our last show, it was from the time I went to work and went home. Because I pass by different encampments, I check on people sometimes. Yeah. To the next morning, on my way back to work at like what five or six in the four or five or six in the morning, depending on which day it was, everything was cleaned out and gone. Nobody was there. I still haven't found some of the people that were there. I was trying to find to see where they moved to, what happened. Yeah. So I don't know. No, I it's mean, crazy. I'm hearing sometimes they're taking people, promising them. Um, you know, something and taking them way out somewhere else and giving them like a little hotel for a night voucher or something. Well, so, so I don't... like it at Echo Park Lake, they promised people they give them project room key. And a lot of the people ended up getting shipped all the way out to Downey um, from Echo Park where they're like, I don't know anyone in Downey, yeah. but like that's you know, so like when they when they get kicked out of the ho- hotel September at the latest, they're going to have no support system. Like when people end up on the streets here, they generally end up within two miles of where they used to be housed because that's the neighborhood they know. That's where their friends are. That's where their family is. Like that's where their support system is. And so LA keeps pushing people farther away from their support system, which just makes it likelier that people are going to end up on the street for longer. When, um, when some other EPL folks got shipped up to uh, Lancaster where they had a hotel, they showed up and were told, Oh, the hotel's not ready for you tonight. You're going to have to sleep on the street. Yeah, that's insane. I mean, people, a lot of people don't really care enough to find out, but these camps are like communities, a lot of them. Some of them are just whatever, but a lot of them, there's been people that have been there for years. Unfortunately, it's disgusting that people have to live on the streets for years and years, 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah. Um, Nobody should have to go through that. But then you had mental illness, and you have this community of people you've known all these years and they're going to grab you out of here and move you somewhere else to people you don't know. And I know just from PTSD, I don't take certain changes too well myself, and I got it pretty good, you know? Yeah. So imagine, I can't even imagine what that would be like. I'd flip the hell. I'd probably go to jail or something. Like, well, I can't imagine. Like, if you've spent time at, like, an Occupy camp, you know, like, uh, when I was out in front of the Metro Detention Center uh, back in 2017, like... Sleeping on the street is so fucking stressful. Like, it's so bad. Like, you're there's cars, there's car exhaust, everything's loud, it's noisy. Like, it's hard to get comfortable. Like, that shit takes a toll on your mental health. Like, you don't end up on the street for a long period of time and don't suffer some of the scars of that because it's just a super traumatic experience. Like, and we don't really deal with that. Like, it's not as simple as, hey, just put a roof over that person's head and they're going to be fine. Like, we as a society owe these people some like deep fucking therapy and restorative therapy to get them to be okay with the trauma they went through. And like, we're not talking about that when we listen to Garcetti and other shitheads in LA talk about like, you know, fixing this crisis. They're not talking about all the other services that are going to have to go into this, like health and mental health and like rebuilding people's quality of life and dealing with the traumas that they just survived. Like that's the bigger lift that we're not talking about. 
Yeah. I mean, that's, that's real. You can't just say, oh, there's four walls. Enjoy your life. Yep. Humans don't work that way. We so need UBIs. I, we need a lot of things for people here, man. We need yeah. health care. We need mental health care. We need UBIs. We need everyone to have a place to live. They, yeah. Like we were talking about before, they build these. In, in, people who aren't from here probably don't know. They build these big, giant buildings full of luxury apartments, $4,000, $6,000 a month to live there. And then, yep. I mean, and, and these places are huge. So, you know, like regular apartments, you could have like 30 on a floor here. But here you might have four or five because they're so huge and luxurious. On the top floors, you might even have one or two. I've been in some of these places. It's better than any house anybody I know lives in. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. it's not rich. But anyway, so you're paying 6000 4000 a month for this. And there's people in tents down there. Why don't they take that building, build a bunch of places, and let people move in for a little bit of nothing? And then if they can't afford it, then our taxes will pay for it. You know, like the home reclaimers out in El Sereno, right? They they saw yeah. those empty homes that Caltrans owns because, like, Caltrans was going to build a freeway. They couldn't build the freeway, but they bought up a bunch of houses that they were going to demolish to build the freeway. And they've just been sitting there empty for decades because Caltrans is being a bunch of assholes. So people just sort of like took the power and occupied some of these homes. And like the first group of reclaimers, they got to keep the homes like the state negotiated to deal with them. But when the second group tried to take like a different set of homes, the state yeah. fought back super hard because the state realized, oh, crap, people have gotten the message that they can negotiate with us into getting housing and we can't have that like rather than letting people flex their muscle and get what they need the state beat up women and children for the crime of moving into an empty house i remember that yeah you know in the uk not i don't know it was maybe a few years ago maybe five years ago i don't know it was a while back yeah there was there was a bunch of um anarchists i believe Lori love was involved for those of you who know he he is um, they took over this big giant building owned by some rich football dude or soccer for people here. And it was being, it was, it was just shut down. Nobody was using it. So they took it over and let all these houses, people move in and they had a community and then the cops would come and try to attack them and they wouldn't let the cops in. Nazis would come and try to attack them. They'd fight off the Nazis. There's a bunch of videos of those. Yeah. And then the cops surrounded it with everybody and like anyone came in and out was getting arrested and they were going to shut it down. Like there was no more hope. And yeah, the, it got so much press that the football dude that owned it had to be like, Oh, you know what? I'm not even going to renovate it for another year. Let them stay till the winter or something. <laughs> and it just all was like good after that. I don't know how good it was. They're still being attacked by people, but yeah. they got it for a while and they negotiated that. There was, but if they didn't um, fight, all those people would have been out in the streets in the cold all that time. There was, um, God, I think it was Minnesota, maybe Minneapolis. I forget exactly where. Uh, it was in the Midwest. Um, uh, a group of like, an almost like food, not bombs type setup. I forget their exact their actual yeah. name. But they basically took over an empty hotel and turned it into supportive housing for an encampment that was like an Echo Park Lake setup. And they got away with it for uh, a couple of months. And then finally the city decided to to crack down on it. But it's kind of, it begs the question, like, why do we have all these empty hotels sitting around LA that we're not turning into housing? Like, it's really fucking stupid, you know? Like, yeah. we keep investing money. We give these hotels billions of dollars a year in tax subsidies. And then a lot of them turned around and said, yeah, we're not doing Project Room Key. And it's like Eric Garcetti could have just seized those hotels. And, like, he should have done that. He should have been like, fuck you, Omni Group. Because their excuse was, well, we don't want to let unhoused people stay in these rooms temporarily because eventually our rich clients are going to come back. And they don't want to stay in a room that a, a you know unhoused person has ever even looked at. So, we you know, we can't have them living there. And it's like – That's a personal problem. Fuck you. Yeah, fuck you. You don't get to have that property anymore. Like, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You You have to deal with that. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, <laughs> if we just keep on going, going, and going, and going, eventually we're going to get to capitalism is the problem. <laughs> Everybody knows it. <laughs> True. True. But it's also, you know, that's one thing I do, uh, I do like is a lot of the, the medics I've worked with um, are indigenous, are very rooted in the idea that community medic work 
is very anti-capitalist. And I think that's something that like is good to, to kind of reframe around this is to, to talk about like why getting this training isn't just good because it's life-saving, but because this sort of skill sharing and teaching and passing on and demystifying of this stuff is one way we keep undermining that system. You know, um, it's one way we also keep ourselves safe without having to interact with that system. Cause like going to a hospital is a fucking expensive and B can be really bad for you. Like if you're black, you get worse care at hospitals. Like the, the numbers just show that out over and over again. Like we need to get away from these white supremacist institutions. And we only do that by building our own. Yeah. There was one protest. It wasn't the one I saw you at was for, um, the Mel, Melly that died that was murdered by the yeah, police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was another yeah. one where we were in Hollywood Boulevard or one of them streets. I think it was Hollywood Boulevard. And they had a whole tent set up, some people from a local hospital. And they were handing out masks and they were handing out waters and they were just asking people if they needed anything. And that would be yeah. nice to have. And they were, you know, they came from a local hospital to support the Black Lives Matter movement. I don't know if they do. I'm assuming maybe some people do and some people don't in different areas. But it'd be nice yeah. if you had, like, people... I know it's, it's hectic at a hospital, but and people work a lot of hours. But, you know, once all this is over and some people maybe have off time, they got together and just did that for encampments like a regular thing. Like, like they could know, like, every two weeks I'm going to have medical care or something. I can get medicine. I can get stuff I need. You know, yeah. just just to take care of myself. Maybe just get some new socks and get my feet washed up or whatever. I know that the county has been talking about working on that stuff, and it's just going frustratingly slowly. Like, it's just not moving at the speed that it needs to move at. And it sucks in a lot of ways. Like, there are some people that are out there trying to work on it, but you have, like, the same nonprofit industrial complex bullshit. Like, USC has a street medicine program, and I know people that have tried to work with it and the, the doctor who runs, it's like, Oh, we're full up. Yeah. We don't, we don't have any more space. Yeah. Sorry. I'll, I'll be in contact in a bit. You know, if we have space and, um, then he'll go on the BBC and be like, Oh, we just don't have enough hands to help us with all the work. And it's like, motherfucker, I know three nurses who tried to volunteer with you that you told them you didn't need them. Like we just kind of see the same bullshit leaking into that sphere. Yeah. I think this might have just been the people. No, you know what? They did add branding on their thing. So, yeah, I, thought, I was thinking maybe ah. just the nurses doing it to themselves. But no, they wanted the whole world to know they were down with Black Lives Matter, which is good. But oh, yeah, it's also a, a tactic companies use to be like, we're going to get your audience too to pay us some money. Yeah, no, it's it's really like the the medical industry especially is like really a wash in anti-blackness and like anti-poverty stances and it kind of sucks you know it's it's doctors are good for some reason or for a lot of things but it's like i feel like going through medical school you should have to take an anti-god complex ca class because like every doctor out there pretty much believes that they're the end-all be-all and like they know everything and it's like no that's just a shitty way to interact with other humans and it get, leads you to treating them not like humans, which is when I go out to encampments. Like, that's one of the big things I encounter talking to people, why they don't want to go to hospitals and they don't want to go to doctors is the way they get treated by the staff and the doctor. And, like, that shit matters. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They have different ways they treat different people. I worked in an ER before years and years ago as a custodian. I wasn't um, anything important, like like a doctor or anything. But I would see what would go on in there. I seen some crazy stuff up in there, man. Yeah. Uh, um, and the, the hospital staffs are split. You know, some people support the movement. Some people don't. Largely depends on how much money they're making, like most things in life. Well, just remember, they used to have, like, some people, homeless people, be out in the parking lot waiting to get help. And they get them in and out fast. And it just it just wasn't the same, yeah. like, come in the waiting room and wait and it's everything. You need this or that or come back here and talk. It was kind of like, oh, such and such is back. They got this or that. And, and and one or two of them would just talk about their medical things like it was no big deal. Like, oh, yeah. they have AIDS and they're doing this and that and the other thing or this and that. And I'm thinking kind of like, why are you telling me this? Yeah. <laughs> this? This violates a lot of ethics. But it's also one thing like with the community medic work we've done is I want to demystify 
some of the medical jargon and stuff for people. Like when I I've worked with encampments and like volunteers from other orgs around LA and we need to get somebody to a hospital and I need to get them admitted. You know, they need to be under the care of a doctor for a couple of days. I have to give the volunteers very exact phrases that they need to tell the nurses. Like there's certain things that they need to say that are almost like magic words, you know, where when the hospital hears that sort of thing, it sends up a flag and then they have to treat this seriously because they're going to treat unhoused people like we just want to get you out the door. Like what is the one thing that we need to fix that will get you out of this bed and get you out of this hospital rather than being like, oh, this is a person who's got like something acute wrong with them, but then also a lot of chronic stuff that we need to treat. Um, and they'll, you know, when you know how to talk to the charge nurse, when you know how to talk to the admitting nurse and you know how to explain what's going on with someone and why it's serious in terms that the nurses understand, it changes the equation. Like you have to learn to advocate for yourself and you have to be there to advocate for your community. So like if you're a white person becoming an encampment volunteer and learning how to advocate for the people out there is one of the best things you can do. Like people will listen to you because of your skin color and that's really fucking stupid. But you can use that to help other people. Like you can use the fact that doctors and police and firemen and other people in authority will listen to you and not like write you off immediately can be a really powerful tool. Yeah. Use whatever you got to get whatever the people need. Yep. By any and all means necessary. Can we, can we switch on it? we got maybe like maybe 10 more minutes yeah, or so. Yeah, wherever you want to go. I just, I just want to, uh, it's not want to stick with the encampments and the houses thing, but just in your opinion, I've had other people talk about this and I talked about it, but just because you're out there too and you see different things maybe than what I see. If you're yeah. trying to um, get like packets together to hand out to people what they probably would need. Um, I know we mentioned socks a bunch of times and there's a bunch of other things, but yeah. like, what would you, what would you put together? Like personally, if you, you know, your ultimate, yeah. you, you like for people that don't have a ton of money, but enough to put some stuff together and go hand them out to do some good. What would you, what would you recommend? Yeah. Socks and underwear, definitely a big one. Uh, feminine hygiene products, both ta- both pads and tampons, um, sunscreen, um, people are outside a lot. Sunscreen is, is really important. Um, skin cancer, you know, can be around for a long, long while before it really turns bad on you. And it's very easy to get it when you're out in the sun all the time. Uh, also those little like, um, um, vitamin C packets and stuff that they, for like colds and flus, which like yeah. they don't really help with colds and flus, but they have a shit ton of electrolytes. And so that's something the body needs when you're not eating the most healthful diet is like, keeping the essential uh, minerals and nutrients in your system. And those little packets are cheap as hell. Uh, They last for a long time and they're really good for people. Um, And then other than that, you know, mainly stuff to stay clean, dry shampoos, um, the shower, like uh, uh, cloths that you can get for like camping and stuff, just things that generally will help somebody stay clean when they don't have access to a shower or access to regular laundry. Um, those are all really, really good things to to get people. Outside of that, you know, ask people what they need. You know, um, also don't give people granola bars. Like everyone on the street fucking hates granola bars at this point. Uh, find yeah. more interesting snacks to give people, like fresh fruit, uh, you know, fresh vegetables, stuff like that. Really good canned foods. Really good. A lot of people have a way to heat cans and stuff in their encampment or in their tent, so they're able to prepare themselves food to an extent. So getting them stuff that's not just like a granola bar and a Capri Capri Sun goes a long way. Yeah, people have more than you think in some of the tents. I mean, oh yeah. Imagine, imagine if if not you, but anyone listening. Imagine if you just lost everything. Your house got taken, your job, you, you have to move out. You're still going to have your stuff, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, until until it gets stolen or taken by the, the city or whatever, you people got stuff out there. They got hot plates, they got stoves, someone got electricity, they got chargers, they got generators. So, yeah, that, that's what I do. I ask people what they need, and then if I can't get it, I try to find somebody that can. A lot of times yeah. people's tents get destroyed or ripped. And, um, I know, you know, Adam, um, yeah, he, he, he's pretty good at finding cheap tents a lot that are pretty decent. Yeah. I need to get with him on that. Cause that might just be something I want to carry around with me is a few tents extra every so often. If you got um, a car and you can carry some extra stuff in like the, the trunk or your hatchback, like I always suggest doing that, like just having a couple of tents back there, you can get, 
you can get a, a cheap tent for like 30 bucks. Now you're not going to the best places in the world. You're having to go to like Walmart and shit, but you know, shelter is shelter. Yeah, definitely. Cause when somebody's tent gets smashed or broken into or ripped or just weather aged and starts to deteriorate a new tent, that's like, that's, that's, that's a big help for somebody oh, yeah. that really can't afford it because, you know, a new tent's going to – now I, I can't eat or I can't get whatever I want or need for a while because I got to get this tent. That's a yeah. big decision for somebody that's not allowed to work and forced to live on the streets in the quote-unquote richest well, country on earth and one of the richest state in the richest country on earth on top of that. There was a, a woman who did some interviews after Echo Park Lake. Um, I think her name was Dana. And she was actually, she was a, it, it, she was working full time pretty much for like Grubhub and Uber and like basically a gig driver who lost her place to live and ended up sleeping in her car outside Echo Park Lake and then moved into the community there because she felt safer there and the cops wouldn't come by and harass her in her car. Like we have people where the most expensive thing that they own is their car. It's the last place they can seek refuge after they get evicted from their apartment. And then the police will come along and tow their home away from them because they had the audacity to sleep in it. I've seen that so many times or because they can't get the tag straight or any little thing. It's been parked here too long. You know, what if the battery dies? Something like that. It's so terrible. And they don't care. I seen the meter mate. I was cursing her out. So how are you taking somebody's home? They should have parked here. What do you mean they shouldn't have? Where were they supposed to go? That's not my problem. Just like no heart whatsoever. Homegirl's on yeah. the ground in tears. Everything she has is in there. She's trying to pull it out before they tow it. And she's like, you yeah. can just call the impound and get it back. It's not a big deal. Like <sighs> For like a thousand fucking bucks. Yeah. Yeah. See, shit. it's just so ridiculous. They don't and care. And then it gets better because what happens is the tow company after um, a while – Uh, generally about a month or so yeah they'll go to court and get an order that allows them to auction the car to try and make back uh the fees for impounding it because the person who owns the car can't pay those and it's just such a perverse system because like those tow companies they also illegally tow cars because they know that you're probably going to find a way to pony up that five or six or seven hundred dollars to get your car back because it's the only way you can get to fucking work yeah there's there's some cities that are kind of more wealthy up up by um you know like chino hills area and all that yeah where i used to live they'd have tow truck drivers that just sat on the streets because they'd have like you could park for 20 minutes on some of these streets and stuff back then so they'd have to, they'd just be sitting there as soon as it went off they'd, they'd go over there and start towing people's cars yeah like immediately no, the meter maid would be right there and then the tow truck just waiting your car be gone before you get out wherever you went funny there's a the part of la that i used to live in like it one area is like a lot of renters and that's where i lived and then like just across the street is like all the single family homes and for some reason all the streets with the single family homes there's not a single fucking sign for street cleaning but of course where the renters live where we're much less likely to have a garage or anything yeah that's uh that's where they do all the fucking street sweeping and tow cars like it's going out of style yeah it's (sighs) It's disgusting. These people just don't care. They get paid. They're mercenaries. They get paid to do their job, and their job is to hurt people sometimes, and they don't give a shit. They shouldn't yeah. be poor and then. They, That's the, on them, right? The city makes a shit ton of money off of parking enforcement and towing cars, and it's it's kind of nuts. It's just a regressive tax. Yeah, and it hurts so many people because then where are you next? You lose your car. What if you need that car to get to the job that's not paying you enough to live anywhere? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we can go on and on man. about it. Well, like I said, if we keep going and going and going. In the end, it comes back to capitalism. <laughs> yep. Somehow, some way. So, yeah, we're. I, I think we um, covered a lot of stuff. Um, if you have anything yeah. else you think we missed or needs to be said um, before we wrap it no, up. I would. Yeah, I just I just encourage everyone out there listening, you know, take the time to learn some basic first aid skills, take the time to like learn how to uh, keep your comrades safe and yourself safe, how to keep your community safe. It's not really like a huge high bar. You just got to invest some time. 
Um, but it's it's really worthwhile, and I think a lot of people enjoy learning this stuff and just knowing, like, hey, I can help if something goes wrong or somebody I know needs help, and that's a really good feeling to have. And other than that, like, stay out in the street, keep uh, keep the good fight up. It's going to be a long, hot summer. Like, the Biden administration uh, isn't going to make things better for anyone. Like, if this world's going to get better, if we're going to survive the climate collapse, we're going to do that because we pulled together and we did it, not because the powers that be gave us fucking anything. Damn straight. So, yeah, and, and get to know your neighbors, not just the ones with homes, all of them. See what you could do yeah. to help them. Um, yeah, this is a great show, really informative, I think. I learned a lot. In the last two shows I did, I learned cool. a lot. So, nice. yeah, nice. I appreciate it. And yeah, of course. I'll probably run into you out in the streets again soon. <laughs> yeah, of course, dude. And be safe until then. Keep up the you really too. good work. For sure. Yeah. All right. And thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm going to cut these streams now. <laughs> if I could find a button. And.